Hello, Bass family, and welcome to Everything Bass with Dale Titus. Um, today, it's actually a, a lesson I put up in response to some questions I've had about playing chords on bass. Um, there's so many chords in the world of music, I'm going to narrow it down to simple, some basic simple chords um, that I use all the time. Uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber to the channel, you can actually go and download this page called Bass Chords. It'll show you a graphic representation of everything I'm talking about. Um, but even if you don't have it, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I think it's something still you can pick up just from the video. So a couple things about playing chords. Uh, normally, most chords sound better higher on the fingerboard um, than they do low. Sometimes when you play intervals low, like the major third, it sounds very muddy and the waveforms of the two notes fight because they're long and slow, so they kind of crisscross in a weird fashion. When you play them higher, the waveforms move much quicker and you can hear more definition. And so it's funny how this can sound so dark and ugly and this can sound so pretty, yet it's the same interval. So, um, so that's one thing. Playing higher on the fingerboard you might find it better. Also the frets are closer together so it's easier to make some of these shapes. The other thing that I do uh, is I'll isolate whatever my bridge pickup is. Here I have a, a Music Man style pickup in the bridge so I isolate it because uh, bridge pickups have a tendency to be tighter and have less uh, bass. Uh, you know, like a, a fullness in the bottom end, whereas the, the neck pickup is a real warm sounding pickup. For most of my playing, I have both on equally on, on all my basses, but when I play chords, I usually isolate the bridge pickup. And likewise, with my, if you have uh, active electronics, um, I'll roll off a little of the bass if that's something um, that helps hear more definition in the chord. So enough of that, let's get into how to play these chords. Uh, the first series of shapes I'm gonna show you have the root on the E string. So how do we play a major seven chord on the bass? Well, one of my favorite fingerings is, I'm gonna do everything on the 12th fret, my three dolphins here. The 12th fret uh, E string is my root. You're gonna play the root here. And then I put the major seven next. So that's the 13th fret on the D string. And then I play the major third up an octave. So the major third is normally down here. I move it up an octave to get it a little bit farther away from the root. So you get this sound. By having the third on top, I really can hear the quality of the major, the major quality of the chord. Whereas if I was to play the arpeggio this way, it's a little bit darker. So I always found by taking that third and moving it up an octave, I get a really clean sound. So some of you might be going, hey, but the major seven arpeggio has a perfect fifth in it. Why aren't you playing that? And I could, it's right here. I could put my pinky down on the 14th fret on the A string. Now the reason I don't is I have found Unless the fifth is altered, like diminished or augmented, it's kind of filler. And what I mean by this, listen if I, I'll use my thumb and I'll strum the chord with the fifth. Now I'll strum it without the fifth, just mute that string. With, without. What I find by removing the fifth, you can more clearly hear the major third and the major seven, which is really gives the quality of the chord. It's what makes it the major seven chord. So that's why I just have the root, the seven, and the third up an octave. So that's a major seven chord played on the bass. Now, well, we'll talk about the right hand in a little bit. Minor seven, this is so simple. Take the same fingers, like I use index, middle, and ring. Everyone's hand's different, but this is my favorite starting point. If you wanna play minor seven, just drop both those down so everything's being played on the same fret as the tonic. So here's the 12th fret, 12th fret, 12th fret. That's a minor seven chord. That's cool. Now, if we look at what's happening intervolically, it, it may, might help you remember this. So on the major seven, we have root, major seven, major third. A minor seven chord has to have a minor seven and a minor third. So as we learned in the Understanding Interval series, we just drop major uh, intervals one fret lower in pitch so they become minor. So this is the minor seven. This is the major seven. See how easy that is? Now the dominant seven is a very cool chord. I use it quite a bit. The dominant seven, if you remember, is a root, major third, perfect fifth, minor seven. So the first thing we're gonna do, we'll put the fifth aside. We got a root and a minor seven, 12th fret, 12th fret, 13th fret. We have a major third again. And this is that really cool sound. So that's the dominant seven chord. 
The last chord is a rarity for some people. If you're going to play jazz, it's not a rarity at all. And, and then there's a lot of forms of, of rock and stuff that are now using a lot more minor 7 flat 5s than when I was a kid. Um, the, this minor 7 flat 5, also known as the half diminished uh, chord, looks like a minor 7. So we're going to go 12th fret, 12th fret, 12th fret. But because the 5th is diminished, we have to add it because it's a big character tone. So we take our pinky and put it on the 13th fret. Now that's a little bit of a finger twister. But that gives us the minor 7 flat 5 chord. Pretty dense chord having the four strings going. I'll show you a variation when we uh, put that chord on with the root on the A string that is a lot cleaner sounding and still delivers the diminished sound. Okay, so that's when the root is on the E string. But if we only learn, learn chords with the root on the E string, we're going to be shifting like crazy and that creates the chance for a lot of bad experiences. So we need to learn the same chord shapes but with the root on the A string. Well, let's start with the major seven. So I'm going to use the A on the 12th fret. We're up here anyway, might as well stay in familiar territory. Same thing, we're gonna put the five away for now, and we're gonna play the root, a major third. Now the major third has to be here because we don't have another string on a four string bass, we don't have another string. So we have root, major third, just to be clear, the major third is the 11th fret on the D string. And then we have the major seven, which is the 13th fret on the G string. So we have the 12th fret for the tonic, the major third is the 11th fret, and then the 13th fret is the major seven, and we've got a major seven chord. Now, when we want to make that a minor seven, if you remember from the other chord shape, to make a major seven into a minor seven, we have to move both the third and the seventh down one fret. So this is the third, has to be here, the seventh has to be here. So now we've got 12th fret, 10th fret, 12th fret. from a minor 7 to a dominant 7 is very simple. As you remember, minor 7 or a dominant 7 has a minor boy, I'm getting a little too fast. The dominant 7th chord has a minor 7th interval in it. So we can leave the minor 7th. So the tonic and the minor 7th will be on the 12th fret. But the dominant 7th chord has a major 3rd. So we have to take this 10th fret and make it an 11th fret again. So it's 12th fret, 11th fret, 12th fret. And we've got now, you notice my fingering, like I'm using the middle finger, it's the longest finger on my hand, so it's, it can reach farthest to get there, and then I have the index finger for the third, and then the ring, ring finger's playing the seventh. <coughs> Excuse me. But you can, if you find another way that works because your hands are a different shape, or everyone's different, your bass is different, got a different width, neck, or whatever, go for it. As long as the, each note rings out, they're clear, there's no buzzes or fret rattles, and you're not hurting, you're not feeling any tension or pain in your hand, then that'll probably work for you. So that's our dominant seventh. Quick review. We have the major seventh chord with the root on the A string, minor seven, and now the dominant seven. Now, when we want to play the minor seven flat five chord with the root on the A string, and we don't want to play an inversion, we want to play it in the root inversion, we, can, we have to get rid of a note. But I don't want to get rid of the diminished fifth. I can't, because that's really one of the predominant sounds of a half diminished or minor seven flat five chord. So on my index finger on the 12th fret A, like before, I'll use my ring finger to play the 13th fret. That's the diminished fifth. Right there. There's so much character right there. I'm going to forego the minor third, and I'm going to put the minor seven on top. So now here's a fingering that gets you pretty much the tonality of a minor seven flat five chord. Just missing the minor third, but there's still enough there that the audience gets the idea that that's a half diminished chord. So let me do a quick review, real slowly, of each of the shapes. There's eight shapes, four with the root on the E string, four with the root on the A string. I'll just say the chord and then play it. The E minor seventh chord on the 12th fret, root on the E. The E minor seven chord, root on the E, 12th fret. The dominant seventh chord, root on the E, 12th fret. Minor seven flat five chord, root on the E, 12th fret. Switching to the A string for all our roots, we have the major seven chord, 12th fret A. Minor seven chord, same spot. Dominant seven chord. And the minor seven flat five chord. So there you go. 
There's, those are uh, four chord types played on two with the tonic on two different strings um, that you can start messing around with. So let's talk about the right hand because um, it seems like people have a lot of questions about that. Um, if I go back to like, a, I'll do a dominant chord, E dominant chord. So one choice you have right away is just thumb index, uh, sorry, yeah, thumb index middle and just play them together. Pinch your hand like pinch, like you're pick, picking something up. That's one choice where you can play the chord all at once. I prefer it over strumming. Strumming can be a bit brash. It could be, you know, kind of harsh to hear. Plus you can hit the string that you're not fretting and it can make some noise and be ugly. So I like this thumb finger finger. Now when you do that, you also can arpeggio it. You can go in a, a lot of different combinations. Here it's just thumb, index, middle, index. The other thing you can do is do thumb and then the two strings, the two fingers together. You know, experiment with it. Um, what might help is don't try to also learn a chord progression while you're experimenting with different um, ways to play with your fretting hand or your plucking hand. Just pick a chord like there. Just grab one chord so you don't have to put your attention at all here and you can really focus here and find different rhythms that work and different combinations of fingering that you like. Um, and I really like playing chords. First of all, if you have a friend who's a bass player and you want to get together and play some songs together, it's cool when one person can play the chords and the other can play a bass line or melody. Uh, if you have a looper, it's really great to loop progressions so you can practice over them. I do that all the time. It's probably one of the biggest things I do uh, practice-wise. Um, and also, sometimes when I'm learning a new, uh, like a tune out of the real book, I'll play the chords first and seeing how the chords move and how uh, you can actually see voice leading happening where, you know, one the third of one chord moves into the fifth of the next chord and things like that. Or you can also see common tones where two chords share the same note which can really inform you as to how you want to improvise over them. So anyway, that's all great stuff. I love playing chords on the bass. It also um, helps us be more rounded uh, musicians. We're not just monophonic bass players. We can understand the polyphony of music and, and really be better songwriters and creators. I think that's so important. So what is today's encore item? It's a bit different, but I wanted to share it and I think it's incredibly valuable. It's simply a notebook, just a notebook. This one I, I think I got for a dollar at a store. <coughs> Excuse me. Why a notebook? One of the biggest problems with um, maximizing our efficiency when you practice is we don't remember what we've done. We don't start at the best point and move on. We end up playing the same stuff over and over again. We already do well. That's not going to make us better player. Well, it's weird. It's not going to expand our musicianship if we just play the same thing over and over again. We'll get very good at that, hopefully. We'll, our technique will be better. But we really won't grow our musicianship if we're just stagnant and playing the same thing over and over again. A journal can help. And there's about a bunch of benefits to the journal, but let's just, like, how would, how would I suggest using it? One is, write whatever the day is and the time that you're sending down to practice. And I think the time's important. I'll talk about that shortly. And then start dividing up your practice. I always start with some kind of warm-up exercise. A lot of times just playing through scales and arpeggios differently, um, doing the advanced te or the technique development drills, things like that. So I'll write down like my starting time and what, what it is I'm doing. If you're, if you're a subscriber, you could write down whatever is on the head of the paper you download and just say, okay, bass chords and write down. And then, um, you can make notes like, ooh, wasn't good, probably should slow down next time, start at 60 beats per minute, things like that. Um, it, it really helps when you're working through a method book, <laughs> if you can write what page number you got to, uh, if you need to review, uh, things like that. Then the next day when you go to practice, take a quick look at what you did the day before and it gives you starting points. It's very good too if you're at the point where you're refining some information and you're using a drum machine or a metronome, you can make your BPM markings there, your beats per minute markings, so that you know what, how quickly you got it up to. Don't start there the next day. Let's say you were doing a technique development drill and you got up to 150 beats per minute after you know a good warm up and you, you've practiced for a while. Don't start at 150 the next day. Go slow it down a little bit and ramp up to that um, because you don't, you know, it's not fair. You, you might not play as well and you get frustrated. You have to work up to these tempos. We have to warm up these musicians just like athletes warm up. Now, what are some of the other benefits of a journal? One is 
it's hard it's hard to gauge our progress sometimes and we can be discouraged you can after a bunch of times practicing you can sit back and think well, i'm not any better i waste all this time what's the point but if you look back and go whoa wow man just a month ago i couldn't play this exercise at 100 beats per minute now i'm playing at 160 beats per minute or wow you know i used to struggle reading eighth notes now i'm reading 16th notes or you know any of these notes that's why it's important for the journal that you have a section where you can write comments what was good what was bad what needs more time um, you know, things like that can really help you, uh, by looking back on them, get inspired and say, wow, I am better. I am investing. Uh, this time I'm investing is paying off. Um, I always use the analogy of when you get like a new puppy or a new kitten, um, and you've had the dog or the cat for a while and you're with it every day. And then someone who saw you the day you first got the puppy and then hasn't come back for like two months and they see it two months later, they're going to go, wow, you're dog or cat's gotten so big, he's gotten so big. It's because, you know, they weren't there every day. And when you're with the animal every day, you don't see the gradual growth. And so someone has to come in and say, wow, look how big. And then you look and go, wow, yeah, I guess he has grown. The same can be said with our playing, our musicianship. Um, we, you know, we're, we're with ourselves every day. And sometimes we focus on more what we can't do than on what we can do and what we have improved on. And so that can be kind of defeating uh, day after day going, I still can't do this. I can't do this. Oh, I got this down, but I can't do this now. And that can be rough. But if we can check back and review the journal every month or so, maybe make a thing where the last day of the month you looked back through your journal, it should inspire you. That's another reason why I think it's important to do recordings just with your cell phone or iPad or whatever. Just record yourself playing and then don't delete it and don't listen to it right away. Put it away and listen to it six months later, a year later. That's encouraging because a lot of times you, you'll think, wow, I, I recorded something great there. And then a year later you go, ooh, wow, I'm better now. See, those are important. Those things fuel us to practice harder. So that's why I do recommend that. So today we covered our bass chords. These are basic bass chords. I will do further videos in the future talking about more complex bass chords, how I navigate some chords that are uh, you know, beyond usually four strings. Um, but right now, just focus on these primary chords and start trying to create songs and trying to, if you have a real book, try to play real book songs. Um, look for songs that just have major, minor, se minor seven, major seven, dominant seven, and minor seven flat five chords. And you'll be able to play the chords and hear the harmony of the tune. And it's pretty exciting and definitely will expand your musicianship. Uh, and of course, don't forget to get a journal that you can journal your lessons in uh, or your, your study time in. I think that's also really important. Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, I really enjoy uh, sharing with you guys. I love reading the comments. Um, please just keep them coming. Um, if uh, The one thing I've mentioned before, this is a bass community, and I want us to always take care of our brothers and sisters on bass. So if someone makes a comment, you know, don't, don't beat them down or don't say anything sarcastic. Please just be uh, encouraging. I really want us to build each other up. I don't want us to tear each other down. So um, please, please be encouraging. I want to encourage people to share. It's a safe space. Uh, if you do want to send me something that maybe you don't feel um, would fit in a uh, comment section or you want to send me a video clip or something where I can see you playing, send that to dtitus at daletitus.com. That'd be great. And other than that, you know, please, as always, if you could uh, like the video and subscribe to the video and hit the bell uh, icon so you'll be notified for future videos. That means a lot to me and helps us grow this channel. And lastly, if you want to be a paid subscriber and support the channel financially, you can do that through patreon.com forward slash everything base. Um, of course, that also gets you access to all of my written materials and other things I plan doing there in the future. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I will see you the next time. Dear Diary, the most amazing thing happened.